Good morning, Cubers. Today we're gonna to talk about the idea of parasitism in Cube and how understanding this idea can help inform your card and archetype choices for your own Cube environments. So what is parasitism? Mark Rosewater says that parasitism is an idea at Wizards of the Coast when there is a specific mechanic that is too self-contained within a specific set and that players don't necessarily like parasitism because they think that WotC is kind of telling them how to build decks instead of letting that player have their own ideas to build their own unique strategies. With Morrow's definition, we can deduce that parasitism refers to archetypes right within magic. To better understand parasitism, let's look first at the roles that individual cards play within archetypes. So to begin, individual cards should not be considered parasitic. Instead, individual cards fall along a spectrum of having either narrow or broad applications. Let's take, for example, a well-known card, Ponder, and see where it falls on this scale. Ponder is a sorcery for one blue that says, look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. You may shuffle and then draw a card. Ponder fits into numerous archetypes. Well, one, why? Because of its inexpensive casting costs, a single blue mana, and its valuable card draw ability, Ponder will basically go into any blue deck. Whether you're playing pure control or more tempo oriented, both styles of blue decks are going to be looking to be running a card like ponder additionally because ponder is a non-creature spell and an inexpensive cantrip it fits very well in prowess style decks decks running cards like monastery swiss spear or third path iconoclast because of these characteristics ponder is a card with broad applicability ponder will likely be played in many different types of decks other examples of cards with broad applicability would be a card like lightning bolt or swords to plowshares or thought seas in some of the other colors these broad applicable cards can be slotted into almost any archetype however because of this broadness these cards alone are not going to pull a drafter into any specific archetypes now let's look at a different card like Sulfuric Vortex. Sulfuric Vortex is an enchantment for one red red that says at the beginning of each player's upkeep, Sulfuric Vortex deals two damage to that player. If a player would gain life, that player gains no life instead. So unlike Ponder, Sulfuric Vortex fits into fewer archetypes. First of all, it's double red mana pip, which means uh, you're gonna wanna be really into red to play this card and not necessarily just splash it. It's mostly gonna fit into aggressive strategies looking to end the game quickly, such as mono red or a, uh, a red-based aggro deck. Sulfuric Vortex would be known as a card with more narrow applicability. Other examples of cards with narrow applicability would be Phyrexian Vindicator, because it takes four white mana pips. Metalworker, a card that's really only to looking to do artifact ramp strategies. A card like Show and Tell, which is really only good in a cheat type strategy. And Tendrils of Agony, a card which is very specific within the Storm archetype. And this sums up the point. Cards have either narrow or broad applicability. With the understanding of how cards can be categorized as either narrow or broad, let's take a closer look at archetypes in general. So what is an archetype? Archetypes consist of individual cards that are working together synergistically to enact a specific game plan. And they fall into four broad categories uh, in Magic, usually aggro, mid-range, control, and combo. So let's use mono red aggro again as an example and take a closer look at the cards that that archetype is looking for. Mono red aggro is looking to deal as much damage as possible as as quickly in the game as possible. Players drafting this archetype are going to be looking for low cost, aggressively statted cards like Goblin Guide and Eidolon of the Great Revel, as well as direct damage cards such as Lightning Bolt, Char, or the aforementioned Sulfuric Vortex. Assessing these cards, we can see that cards like Goblin Guide and Eidolon and Vortex all have a more narrow applicability along the spectrum, while cards like Lightning Bolt and Char have a broader application, right? Many decks are looking to do direct damage as either creature control or to kill a planeswalker, not just mono red. And this yields an important insight. Archetypes have their own spectrum regarding necessary density of narrow cards. Mono red aggro is looking to play some narrow cards, but also takes advantage of cards with broader applicability. 
Let's look at another example. Poison is an archetype looking to defeat the opposing player through poison counters rather than through damage. If a player accrues 10 poison counters, they lose the game. So players drafting this archetype will be looking for ways to give their opponent poison counters. Some examples of types of cards and mechanics that do this would be infect creatures like Lost Leonin and Plague Stinger, cards with the toxic mechanic like Skyrell's Hive, and cards with the proliferate mechanic like Experimental Augury. Assessing these cards, we can see that Lost Leonin and Plague Stinger are below rate creatures for their mana value and stats, but they do have the infect mechanic. So likely only players drafting a poison style deck are going to be interested in these creatures. Now, Skyrell's Hive, on the other hand, is an enchantment and token generator whose tokens have the keyword toxic. Players interested in a token or go wide archetype or potentially a sacrifice archetype or a poison archetype would be interested in this card. Finally, Experimental Augury is a card selection spell with proliferate. So players interested in plus one plus one counter mechanics or players playing a lot of planeswalkers or a player playing the poison archetype would likely play Experimental Augury. So as you can see, the poison archetype requires a density of cards with the poison mechanic to be viable, though there is some cross synergy with archetypes that simply care about counters. This leads us to a second idea that the higher density of narrow cards an archetype requires to be viable, the more what we will term parasitic that archetype should be considered. Other examples of archetypes that require a higher density of narrow cards to be viable would be archetypes such as energy, storm, or enchantress. Now, parasitic archetypes are not inherently bad, only that those archetypes require a higher density of narrow cards to be viable. Narrow cards within cubes are also not bad on their own. In fact, narrow cards can act as signposts to drafters letting them know that certain archetypes are supported in the environment. Conversely, while cards with broad application can fit in numerous archetypes, cards with broad application do not pull drafters towards any specific archetype. Broad applicable cards do, however, act as glue that can provide function across numerous archetypes within a cube. However, a cube with only broad applicable cards probably start to feel homogenous with all decks looking and working similarly. I'd like to highlight Dan Schneider uh, who is exploring this space with narrow, normally termed parasitic cards in a cube he's creating called the Parasitic Cube 2.0. Dan has specifically created an environment that hosts traditionally parasitic archetypes such as heroic, poison, enchantress, and energy. But Dan has structured his environment in a way that these archetypes are cross-supported. I've linked his cube down in the show notes. I think you should go check it out. Additionally, I encourage you to listen to the archetype diversity versus archetype redundancy episode of the 540 podcast with Ryan Overturf and Ryan Sachs. Their pod link is also in the show notes below. And finally, a big thank you to everyone who provided thoughts and inputs on this topic. Y'all rock. Hopefully this video gave you a few ideas when considering narrow and broad cards and how those cards fit into different archetypes and provided you a better understanding of the parasitism of archetypes within cube. Well, anyways, thanks for hanging. Thanks for chilling with me here. Don't touch that dial and let's keep cubing.